because there are one or two people, misguided in my opinion, who believe that we need all of this wonderful stuff about renewables, but we also, because of the desperate circumstances around accelerating climate change, we also need nuclear power. Now, <coughs> you know who some of these people are. <laughs> they are a bit problematic because the essence of genuine sustainable energy strategy is to get two things right. One, energy efficiency. And now, none of us this evening, unfortunately, are going to have a chance really to lay out the stall on energy efficiency. But nothing that we need to achieve on renewables can be done without efficiency as the foundation platform on which every other generation option can actually deliver the goods. It often gets left out. Sadly, it'll probably get left out again this evening, but you can rest assured that we all know that. Okay. It is absolutely fundamental. But it is a lost cause in this government. It was a lost cause in the Labour government. It has been a lost cause in every single modern government. We have never had a single government minister, and we did some work on this in the Sustainable Development Commission, we've never had a single minister responsible for energy who ever understood the foundational importance of energy efficiency. It's one of the reasons why we're still so far behind countries like Denmark, Sweden, Germany, and so on. So, the first thing we absolutely have to get right is energy efficiency, even if I'm not going to say anything more about it tonight. The second thing we have to get right is not doing the wrong things. Oh, I know that sounds really obvious, but this government is intent on trying to get us now to do some really humongously stupid wrong things in a way that will literally bugger it up for everything else. You've heard about the EMR, I'll come back to that in a minute, but please understand the scale of this because it is absolutely critical. Now, this is a Green Party audience, as a member of the Green Party, I don't think I really need to lay before you all the arguments against nuclear power. You pretty much understand that. You know, some of them come from a deep moral conviction about no generation having the right to impose on the next generation a set of problems that it itself has been transparently unsuccessful at dealing with, namely nuclear waste. You'll know all the concerns about safety, about radiation, about proliferation caused by civil nuclear power turning into a source of nuclear capability of a military kind. And you probably worry a bit like me about the degree to which all of that opens up the door to really very frank security risks in our heartland here in terms of those nuclear facilities and what it is that terrorist organizations must think of from time to time when they think about what is the easiest way of taking a new target and going after it either with a physical assault or some kind of cyber assault which is the thing that worries our security forces most in this country. You know all those arguments. Most importantly, however, is the economic argument. Because this economic story is becoming more and more unbelievable every month. It's difficult to keep track of it. When Vincent de Rivas, the chief executive of EDF, I don't have any hesitation, naming this company as you can imagine. <laughs> a man who looms fairly large in my imagination from time to time. When Vincent de Rivas first launched his campaign to bring the EPR, a joint venture between EDF and the construction company they work with, Arifa, when he first started to try and sell the case into government, he was absolutely emphatic that it would require no government support whatsoever, either in the construction phase or in the operation phase. No support whatsoever. In his latest declaration, Vincent de Rivas indicated that each EPR, two at Henry Point and two projected for size one, each new EPR would come in at no less than seven billion pounds a pop. That is 28 billion pounds just straight off like that. And of course, at that point, he said, well, look, you know what we said earlier about this subsidy story? We're really sorry. We're going to need quite
quite a lot of help on this. In fact, we're going to need about two billion pounds a year over the course of the next 25, 30 years to make this work. It is absolutely standard. And if you follow the details of this debate, and you look at what EDF has foisted on this country in order to secure its own prospects and its own balance sheet in France and elsewhere in the world, it is remarkable that they have been able to get away with this for quite so long. It's also, as you will all understand, exposed the deep and utter dishonesty at the heart of the Liberal Democrats today. I say that with some sense of regret, because I've worked with Lib Dems over 40 years as part of the campaign against nuclear power. I've been through some of their debates about this, tracked the way in which the party arrived at an anti-nuclear position, which was as strong as the Green Party's position, and I've now watched what has happened to the Lib Dems once they came into the coalition government. And to be absolutely honest, if I was a Lib Dem MP now, and I was looking at the commitments that I had made as an MP prior to the election, then during the course of the coalition negotiations, and where we are now, I would feel nothing but burning shame at the degree to which I was forced to lie about the key tenet of the economics of nuclear power, that you cannot build nuclear power stations without massive public subsidy. And Ed Day, good guy, glad Julius working him over, keep on it, good guy. The fact that he has to stand up in audiences like this and say there will be no public subsidy for nuclear power stretches the bounds of what we mean by political mendacity <laughs> right <laughs> to a breaking point. So we're in the midst of a really deep and difficult political debate. And I say all of these things because, sadly, we cannot rest easy in this debate about <coughs> nuclear power. A bit of me sort of says, oh, relax, Jonathan, there's such a bumblingly incompetent industry. They're so massively incapable bringing investor-friendly propositions to market. They're so wrapped up in all different forms of corruption, both explicit and implicit. They never get it right. They always tell lies. There's no way any investors are going to go for this. So relax. Do all the positive stuff. Get out there. Support good energy. Do photovoltaics and wind and everything else. And just don't worry about that industry. A bit of me. God, do I want to see that. But as Paul said, this corpse of the nuclear industry is well and truly reanimated, if you put it. Well and truly. It doesn't matter how many times this corpse has been dispatched into its grave, it has an uncanny ability to rise back out of that grave and give us all a great deal of trouble. So right now, instead of doing what I would like to be doing, which is advocating enthusiastically for energy efficiency and for renewables, I'm having to dedicate a large amount of my time to fronting an anti-nuclear campaign with three former directors, four of us in all, of Friends of the Earth, who all, for various reasons, felt, and I hope Paul will forgive me here, that the existing NGO opposition to this new life that the nuclear industry has taken on was bordering on the pathetic. If the NGOs in this country were really focused on what the nuclear industry is trying to do, I'm not sure we would have had to constitute ourselves into a little ginger group to take up the cudgels on this case. But we have. And I'm sorry to say there are quite a lot of people in the environment movement who have actually peeked over the edge of the coffin of nuclear power and try to work out what it would feel like to lie next to it. <laughs> How comfortable would that be? How good would it make them feel as part of their work to secure a decarbonization?
globalized economy here and around the world. And this is a compounding factor. This is a real difficulty. Although I make light of it, it's actually really difficult because the case against nuclear is being weakened by these things. It's being weakened by the lack of political opposition. Because I'm sorry to say the Labour Party is as ill-informed, slippery, and mendacious on this as the Lib Dems. I'm sorry to say that the NGOs are not in a brilliant place on this. Delighted to hear from Paul that there's now a gathering coalition campaign about electricity market reform, and that will certainly help. As long as you put at the top of the paper that the entire EMR process has essentially been rigged to get that corpse back out of its coffin and back into our lives again. That's why it's such a mess. If the government didn't have to square nuclear quotes without subsidy quotes through the EMR, it would still be disastrous, the EMR process, but it wouldn't be the mess it is today. No, we probably don't need me. <laughs> and then lastly, the debate has been hampered by the fact that there are a small, very <coughs> vocal and eloquent number of experienced green activists who have come out in favor of nuclear power, who have even declared themselves to have fallen <coughs> in love with nuclear power. <laughs> so great is their concern about climate change. Now, they may not mean it, but the damage that they have done to the anti-nuclear cause is severe. And I have watched how their words, however honestly they may have put them into the public domain, I have watched how their words have been ruthlessly manipulated <coughs> by the nuclear industry to demonstrate that this is now technology which can lay claim to some kind of set of sustainability credentials. Rest assured, it absolutely cannot. And the Green Party and Friends of the Earth and everybody else who is seeking to achieve the kind of inspiring vision for a sustainable energy future that you've heard about from Paul and Juliet, everybody has got to commit all over again, I'm sorry to say, to putting that bloody industry back in its coffin, hopefully for the last time. Thank you.